Photo 51. The double helix form. The microscope. This is Rosalind Franklin, the woman who discovered the structure of DNA. Rosalind Franklin is a scientist and um, she's Jewish, she's a scientist, she's female. There's so many things that um, put her into a world with her defenses up. To me, what, what's fascinating about Rosalind Franklin is that she was um, a brilliant scientist who you know, lived at a time when it was very hard to be a female scientist. Now, you will be confused because you have been taught that it was James Watson and Francis Crick who discovered it. See, these two men wouldn't have made it if it weren't for Rosalind Franklin. But even if she carries this huge importance, she has been left out of the narrative. Since she is not given the credit she deserves, and more people need to know about her, she is the featured woman of this episode. How did she discover the correct structure of DNA? Why was she left out of the narrative? But most importantly, who was Rosalind Franklin? Who was the woman behind the microscope? It's a magical moment in Photograph 51. Scientist Rosalind Franklin sees the double helix of a DNA molecule. Franklin is a forgotten heroine of science. She wasn't called Dr. Franklin, she was called Miss Franklin. She wasn't allowed to eat in the senior common room. All the men were allowed to eat at the senior common room. Franklin was a pioneer whose valuable DNA photograph helped change the world of genetics forever. Everything that Rosalind Franklin accomplished and how much more she could have accomplished had she not been isolated and misunderstood and discriminated against. It is the 25th of July, 1920, in Notting Hill, United Kingdom. Rosalind Elsie Franklin is born. She is the daughter of Ellis Arthur Franklin and Muriel Frances Valley, and she is the second of five children. Ellis, her father, is a politically liberal merchant banker, and her mother, origins from a line of academics and scientists. They are a wealthy and Jewish family that values a good education. <laughs> she was a good big sister, but she was um, she was working very hard and sort of busy on homework and what was then called a trick. So and that's when I first became aware of her. I I know that you've talked before about her her support from the rest of your family. What were your parents like supporting you, your brothers, and Rosalind in following through into an academic career? Well, they assumed we'd all go to university. Beyond that, Rosalind was the only one with an academic career and as such. She receives education at several schools, including the St. Paul's Girls' School, one of the only that teach physics and chemistry. This school is also focused on preparing girls for a professional career and values the setting of their goals beyond marriage. The science education she develops at this school would help shape the knowledge she would use in the future, because at the age of 15, Rosalind decides to become a scientist, over the objections of her father, who wants her to go into social work instead. In 1938, she graduates from St. Paul's and earns a scholarship for her excellence in Latin, science, and sports. With this, she enrolls at Newham College, University of Cambridge, and studies chemistry and physics there. For her graduation from university, Rosalind is awarded firstly the second class honors during her finals, 
which is accepted as a bachelor's degree in the qualification for employment, and secondly, a fellowship to conduct the research in physical chemistry in Cambridge. Accepting this, she works under Ronald George Rayford Norrish, until working for him would become unbearable. After discovering a fundamental error in the project he assigned her, she clashes with him, but he refuses to accept her findings and demands she repeat the experiments. Because of this, Rosalind decides to resign. When World War II breaks out in 1939, Rosalind dedicates herself to serving as a London Air Warden for some time. Then she would work as an assistant research officer at the British Coal Utilization Research Association, where she would study porosity, helpful for the war effort. In fact, through this, Rosalind helps classify coals and accurately predict their performance for fuel purposes and for the production of gas masks. In 1945, the same year that the war ends, Rosalind obtains her PhD in physical chemistry at Cambridge University, basing it on the research she had carried out during the previous years. Following this, Adrienne Weil helps her land a position at the Laboratoire Central de Service Chimique de l'État in Paris, and she would work with Jacques Mering there for four years. During this time, he teaches her the X-ray diffraction and she pioneers in the structural changes caused by the formation of graphite in heated carbons, work that would prove valuable for the cooking industry. In 1951, knowing that in order to advance her scientific career, she should leave Paris, Rosalind decides to move back to London and begins working as a research associate at the King's College London in the biophysics unit. Director John Randall tells her to use her expertise in X-ray diffraction techniques for the study of the DNA as she is the only experienced experimental diffraction researcher at the time. Morris Wilkins and Raymond Gosling have been carrying out X-ray diffraction analysis of DNA in the unit since May 1950. But now Rosalind would take over both the DNA diffraction work and guidance of Gosling's thesis. When Wilkins returns from his vacation, he is surprised to find her working there, because Randall hasn't told him about it. He's upset to learn that the female assistant who he had expected would be working for him is instead a formidable researcher in her own right. Due to this misunderstanding, the atmosphere between the two scientists tenses. Wilkins begins to spend more time at the nearby Cavendish Laboratory with his friend Francis Crick. He and his partner, James Watson, are also working on a theoretical model-based approach to trying to discover the structure of the DNA molecule. Nevertheless, it is Rosalind and Gosling who get there first. In 1951, they make the discovery that the DNA structure consists of two forms and not one. This was the thing that I remember most in those days, the feeling of tremendous excitement when I developed the first picture of uh, DNA crystals. I don't think I realized at that time that uh, it was going to be uh, the basic discovery of the uh, century. It's a perfect X. It's a helix. I don't know.
And why is that precisely? He knows perfectly well. She says you know perfectly well. My lord! Because of the intense personality conflict developing between Rosalind and Wilkins, Randall divides the work on DNA along the two forms. We'll work separately then. I'll take the A form and you can have the B. Maybe I'd like A. Morris, you're being ridiculous. By the end of the year, it is generally accepted at King's that the B form of the DNA is a helix. But after Rosalind records an asymmetrical image in May, she becomes unconvinced that the A form of the DNA is a helix as well. Throughout the year, Rosalind keeps running tests on it, with mathematical analysis and resolving the differences between the two forms. By January 1953, Rosalind concludes that both DNA forms have helices, so she starts to write a series of three draft manuscripts which include a double helical DNA backbone. That month, Watson travels to King's carrying a preprint of Linus Pauling's incorrect proposal for the DNA structure, which considers it to be a triple-stranded model. Right now is not possible, unfortunately. So Morris thinks you're anti -healing. Morris has no business saying who or what I am. The unimpressed Rosalind becomes angry when Watson suggests she does not know how to interpret her own data. What did you just say? How much theory do you have? Why are you here, Jim? As an American, uh, uh, I can walk into someone's office without being asked. I had the Pauling manuscript. Uh, I don't think we called up Wilkins. I just said, I'll take it up there. I walked into Rosalind's office because I wanted to find her. I didn't, you know, I just opened the door and walked in. And then, so she caught me in her office. So, you know, this was something that only a thief would. You know, the only one would be in her office was there, someone trying to steal her data, which she probably would have thought, yes, they want my data. Around this time, Rosalind also attends a conference given a Cavendish to observe an early DNA model being proposed by Watson and Crick. Rosalind was tickled pink because we'd been working away and we knew from the way we could take water in and out of the structure and further change the structure from one crystalline to a paracrystalline thing with ease that the things that the water were attaching to was the sodium and phosphorus, you had the phosphate group and the sodium sitting there, and that attracted a whole lot of water molecules around it. So the water going in and out meant that the phosphoruses must be on the outside. And so she laughed at them, uh, much to their discomfiture, I think, and uh, said, oh look, you've got it inside out, the phosphoruses are all on the outside. And they are for the following reasons, and she explained her uh, experimental work and her reasoning, and so they sat back and absorbed that and suitably chastened. They, uh, I don't know what they did, they probably didn't do anything for, 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 for a while. Rosalind is interested in producing far greater evidence before publishing as proven a proposed model. Therefore, Rosalind is not eager to collaborate with the two men. During her time at King's College London, Rosalind has a very bad time. Not only is her working atmosphere tense, people in the lab have also begun talking behind her back and calling her different nicknames, such as the Dark Lady or Rosie. They would even refuse to address her as Dr. Franklin. All right, Rosie. My name is Rosalind, but you can call me Miss Franklin. <laughs> Fine. Everyone else does. Fine. 
course, I prefer Doctor Franklin, but that doesn't seem to be done here, does it, Mr. Wilkins? Doctor Wilkins. <laughs> Doctor Wilkins, I don't joke. I take my work seriously, as I trust you do too. Due to this situation, in 1953, she decides to move to Birkbeck College to escape Kings. But then, that same year, the unexpected happens. Morris Wilkins changes the course of DNA history. What Rosen didn't know, that they had seen the MRC report in 1952. Um, apart from uh, Morris Wilkins showing uh, Jim Watson Rosalind Franklin's photograph, which made his eyes open, um, and which he hadn't seen before, there was also the MRC report, circular among MRC units, which gave the, uh, the critical dimensions which they could deduce the diameter of the helices, and gave all the... So between that, they had all the information to build the model. But, um, so Watson's book, this only came out when Jim Watson published his book, The Double Helix. Now, the space group, C1, was by accident the same one that Francis worked on, the hemoglobin, that in his hemoglobin groups that he was studying, a particular space, was C1. So he knew all the axes, the symmetry, and realized and met that there were two chains running in opposite directions. He knew that the moment he learned the space group, he immediately wanted me to believe it, and I didn't understand space group, so I wasn't sure this was a hard fact I had to put in. And it wasn't until I found the base pairs that then Francis put it in the whole thing. When did Frank? In April, Watson and Crick published their model in the magazine Nature, taking complete credit for Photography 51. When they wrote their paper in 1954 on the how they arrived at the double helix uh, with the base pairing, of course Watson got the base pairing, there's no question about that. But the fact is that the framework, the double, the double helical structure, was based by Crick understanding the implications of the space group symmetry that Franklin had described. There's no, now what they should have done is they should have, in they wrote their paper, they should acknowledge this. It wouldn't have diminished their achievement to do it. They only include a footnote acknowledging that they were stimulated by a general knowledge of Rosalind's and Wilkins' unpublished contribution. Both Wilkins' and Rosalind's articles are published second and third in the same issue of the magazine. But it appears that their articles merely support Crick and Watson's. To this day, I don't know whether, how much she knew of what they, she must have suspected that Crick and Watson must have known a good deal about her work, but none of it was published other than the MRC report. And she doesn't complain either, likely as a result of her upbringing. When leaving King's College, Randall tells Rosalind that she shall not work on DNA anymore. So she turns her attention back to the studies of coal. At Birkbeck, Rosalind studies the structure of the tobacco mosaic virus and the structure of RNA, again using X-ray crystallography. In five years, Rosalind publishes 17 papers on viruses and her group would lay the foundation for structural virology. She eventually also helps Gosling to finish his thesis, and together they publish the first evidence of double helix in the A form of DNA in the 25th of July issue of The Nature. In 1954, she would also start working with R. and Klug, which would lead to a long-standing and successful collaboration. Two years later, she would have a personal affair with her once postdoctoral student, Donald Kaspar. She later remarks that Kaspar was one she might have loved and might have married. In 
mid-1956, while on a work-related trip to the United States, Rosalind begins to suspect a health problem because her stomach had bulged and she knew that she wasn't pregnant. Her case is marked urgent and she is hospitalized not long after. An operation on the 4th of September of that same year reveals that there are two tumors in her abdomen and Rosalind is diagnosed with ovarian cancer. While undergoing three operations and experimental chemotherapy, she continues working and her group continues to produce results such as 13 papers in two years. Even if she's hospitalized every now and again throughout 1957, Rosalind would always keep up her work. In the next year, she would even be given a promotion to research associate in biophysics. When she falls ill again in March, though, she would not go back to work this time. Rosalind Franklin passes away on the 16th of April, 1958, in Chelsea, London, at the age of 37, and is interred in the family plot at Wilston United Synagogue Cemetery. She's one of the forgotten, but most important scientists of all time. Not only did she have to prove herself as a woman in a male-dominated work environment, she was also doomed because of her independent attitude. Even if she made history, she did not get the credit she deserved. And more specifically, the Nobel Prize she deserved. Nevertheless, she didn't give up and kept working hard in this unusual environment, opening many doors in biology for generations to come. Rosalind was not just forgotten in history. She taught us that women don't have to be afraid to stand up for themselves when they see an injustice happen. Rosalind Franklin is a superwoman.